Hello and welcome to the Atlanta History Center's virtual author talk series. I'm Virginia Prescott from GPB and your host for this series. Tonight I'm going to be speaking with Sarah Maslin Neer about Horse Crazy, the story of a woman and a world in love with an animal. She was able to sign book plates for acapella books so you can purchase a book using the link. It's in your chat. There's also a link provided on the Atlanta History Center's website so you can buy it from there. And as Sarah and I are talking, please do send your questions. You can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen and I will try to integrate as many of them as possible to into our conversation. Sarah Maslinier is a staff reporter for the New York Times. She's worked with a number for a number of beats for the newspaper including covering such things as let's see earthquakes in Haiti I'm thinking kidnapping in West Africa wildfires in California covering the city's nightlife among them she was a finalist for the 2016 Pulitzer Prize for her investigation of labor practices and health issues in New York City's nail salon industry. And she still managed to do a lot of horseback riding along the way. Sarah Mazanier, welcome. So glad to have you with us. Thank you for having me. What a treat. You know, think about those stories that you've covered along the way and the work that you've done as a reporter, which seems kind of a world apart from what we think of as the elite sport of the upper crust, the horsey set. Does that horse crazy part of your brain feel distinct from the reporter part? Well, it's a su super significant, interesting question you ask because the truth is I only came out as a horse girl uh, about two years ago and I kept it absolutely secret because I was worried that I cover incredibly hard corners of the earth, really some of the most dire things you can press your nose up against. And I was worried I wouldn't be taken seriously if I revealed that so much of my identity and my mind and my soul is caught up with ponies. Uh, you know, how, how, can, how can she have, be both? And I was speaking to a friend of mine um, and he said, Sarah, this was about two years ago, uh, all that matters is passion. He said, passion translates. That's what people will understand. And, and I, my worries that I would be marginalized and pigeonholed uh, really were superseded by the idea that passion is universal. Even if someone doesn't share a passion for horses, passion translates. And that was my coming out. There's so much passion in this book. It really <laughs> is infectious in a way. And we learn a lot about the horsey part of your brain. You grew up, as you write, having conversations with horses I long to have with my family. So what are the, some of the things that you couldn't or wanted to say to your family? Well, I come from a blended family uh, that also has a lot of intergenerational trauma suffusing through it. And I really unpack that in the book because I, I call the book, it's not a book about horses, although it's called Horse Crazy and there's a lot of horses in it. It's really a book about obsession. It's a reported look at obsession through the lens of my own. And I turn my investigator's lens on myself, which I've never done before. As a reporter for the New York Times, we are forbidden from using the word I, we, you know, it, it's beaten out of us. Um, and yet I, I, I did that here. Um, so this blended family, my brothers are uh, decades older than me. And I became a representation of the dissolution of their own family, uh, mm -hmm. of, of the world that they were supposed to inherit, the, the loving father and mother, the family unit, unit that crumbled. Um, and so I walked around this earth in my early years wondering, what had I done to make these people who are supposed to love me, loathe me? And I didn't realize it was being born. And uh, my father was a Holocaust survivor and he carried that load on his shoulders that although every day of his life, uh, ultimately having survived, uh, when we'll get into this, I'm sure, uh, survived as he would say, 80 million Germans who were trying to murder a nine-year-old boy was a defiant victory lap. There still was a tremendous burden on him um, in being the other, being the persecuted other. Uh, and so horses became a source of stability and kindness. And horses would always be there for me in a way that my family wasn't able to be. So he was somebody who came from another place, had an accent. And you, you felt like an interloper in your posh prep school, Brearley, on Manhattan's Upper East Side. But both your parents were acclaimed in their fields, so their fame was not enough? It's so interesting. I am externally, uh, phenotypically, demographically, every part, uh, the role that my family had me play, the posh Upper East Side girl in the private school. I am part of that community. 
but the internal messaging I had, and I say in the book, so crisply is intergenerational trauma Mm -hmm. passed through generations that I didn't know it at the time. I felt that I was in hiding just as my father was with a false baptismal certificate that denied his Jewish identity as a little boy. I felt like I was in hiding in my posh prep school. Obviously the traumas were not even uh, close to mortal. And I, I talk about that that uh, battling with the fact that compared to my father, my life was of ease and is of ease, right? Compared to anybody uh, who survived the the crushing fulcrum of war. Um, But I felt that that trauma was my own. I inherited it on an atomistic level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you do. Uh, You found this abiding passion for horses. Um, which, as you said, induce sometimes survivor's guilt or just just living your life induce survivor's guilt. And as you put it, even writing intermingled paragraphs about ponies and Nazis feels off. I think it works. But how did you work through that as a writer? Well, it's it's interesting. And I feel if if our audience hasn't read the book, they'll be like, ponies, Nazis. Like, (laughs) I I, I think about horse people picking up this book and, you know, died in the wool horse people. And they'll be like, why is there so much Hitler in this book about horses? You know, Um, but those are the threads of my life that braided together make me. And I can't deny that. Um, should I, I tell a little anecdote about my father? Yeah, Yeah, so this is a story. We welcome anecdotes. Um, we, this is a story in the book, and it, you know, spoiler alert, it, it, it does spoil a, a tiny bit of the story, but you're my captive audience, all of you, so you got to listen. Um, it, my father uh, came with me once to a horse show when I was uh, 16, and I was convinced, here I am, this Jew who doesn't belong in this world of, you know, waspy uh, people who have this in their family for generations. I felt like an interloper throughout my uh, passion with these animals. And I competed at this elite competition. uh, And immediately after I finished the course of jumps, I put my horse away. And I went to find some funnel cake because that's what I thought, uh, you know, uh, uh, the the, the immigrant child here is here to do. She shows up, you know, who's she? And my dad, knowing nothing about horses, uh, waited all day long by the side of the riding ring. And I actually came in second out of all of those horses on the East Coast. And they walked into the winner's circle, these glossy horses, and behind the first one trundled my little old bald dad. And he put that red ribbon on his chest and he turned to the judge and he said, I defeated Hitler. (laughs) And that is how bound up with his identity, every part of this sport, every part of his life was. He saw his life and my existence as this victory lap. Um, You know, the best revenge is living well, Um, but in a way it was a statement that you had tried to erase our people and here we are on the map galloping across it. Mm -hmm. And so those intermingled paragraphs of ponies and Nazis, you know, they're my identity. You know, they they were there on that show jumping field and, and they're there in my soul. It really is such an amazing story. And there are so many layers to it. You, you talk about his immigrant identity, um, what was he? He wore a tuxedo to his first Fourth of July. Yeah. <laughs> well, he thought he was like, it's the birth of the nation. This is an significant day. And he wore a, a tuxedo to a, a barbecue, his first in America. Okay, on to ponies, because yeah. we really want to hear about those. So through <laughs> persistence and taking jobs before you were of legal age and hitchhiking to barns and following leads to get free horses, you became a girl with a horse. Mm-hmm. Many of us, I would uh, hasten to say, had to settle for Briar's plastic model horses lined up in our bedrooms. <laughs> She's got one in the house. <laughs> There's a, just an unbelievable chapter in the book about the annual gathering of Briar's collectors. So what happens there at Briar Fest? So... That is just wild. Um, I talk about in the book, there are 7 million horse own, horses in America, um, but there are many more million people who love them. And as you rightly point out, horses are very, very hard to access. Uh, there are many, many financial barriers. Um, and there is this thing called the Briar horse, which above my little head is a plastic model horse. They are uh, one to 10 replicas to the exact of a horse. and there has emerged a world of people who don't just collect them, Virginia, like you and I did. They compete them. And they don't take pictures of it. 
they bring them around the country and compete the plastic horses against each other. And I'm not saying they compete dioramas they made or paint jobs they did. They compete store-bought model horses against store-bought model horses. And I arrived at this competition really um, in violation of every tenet of a journalist. I wasn't curious. I was snobby. I was uh, judging. I thought this, is, oh, by the way, it's not children. It's adults. I thought, you know, how can this be enjoyable? Uh, a lot of the people told me um, this makes me feel closer to a real horse. And I thought it could only make you feel more distant mm -hmm. because, you know, it, it only, to me, uh, represented the absence of the horses when you see these uh, clattery uh, cellulose acetate. Um, and then as I spent the day there with these people brushing horses with makeup brushes and running from table to table like they were running from competition ring to competition ring, I felt ashamed of myself. Mm -hmm. And I realized that here were people playing. Here were people fully inhabiting the spirit of what a horse does for the soul, which is set it free. And they were free. And I came into that room full of constraint. Um, and as I left, I come to the conclusion that I envied them. And I wish that I had been them when I was young. And I wish I can be them when I'm older um, because they were truly horse crazy no caveat, no plastic horse crazy. They were horse crazy. Well, you've got at least one you could enter, <laughs> it looks like. <laughs> but you know, there's, there's just, I think, one male competitor in this at the Briar Fest that you went to. Mm. Among many girls and women, mostly adult women, what is it about girls and horses? So my Freudian psychiatrist father would probably make a wry joke, you know, oh, uh, girls want power over something huge between their legs, you know, and I don't know if he's wrong about that. I don't think that's just pervy. Um, but if you think about the compellingness of uh, many little girls start to ride and there's a fascination, there is really no opportunity for a very little girl to have complete control and extreme power. What's more powerless than a little girl in our society if you stack everything up? Uh, you don't have autonomy, you don't have selfhood, you're also seen weaker than a little boy, um, perhaps you're more coddled. And astride a horse, they lend you their power. And there's something incredibly compelling about being in control of all that power. And I write in the book that atop a horse, I was in, as in control of my life, at, excuse me, I was as in control as I wasn't anywhere else in my life mm -hmm. as a little girl. But right. Really you, you also say uh, two legs, Sarah, four legs, you know, just unbelievably powerful or what yeah. word do you use? Formidable. Formidable. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, uh, I, I think about why the sport is uh, so predominantly female, even uh, towards the upper levels. It's actually the only Olympic sport where men and women compete equally against each other, huh. uh, which is really interesting. But I think it has a connotation of being girly. And I liken this in my book. Um, when I was a bartender in the Hamptons, one of the ways to afford uh, riding lessons, I would work the barn in the morning and the barn at night. I see barn and then bar. Um, I would make cosmopolitans. A cosmopolitan is 99.9% .9 alcohol with a tiny bit of cranberry to make it pink. And a guy would walk up to the bar and order a beer for himself, you know, and something girly for my girlfriend and I get a Cosmo. And a Cosmo is unbelievably strong and a beer is pretty wimpy. Um, but that pink connotation, the feminization of the drink makes it girly. And I'll bring it back to horses, I'm not just getting off the beaten track here, is that riding is an extreme sport. I've broken my vertebrae multiple times. You know, it's as extreme as rock climbing or uh, snowboarding, but that feminine connotation makes it soft. Um, and I think we need to examine that and unpack it. And, and many other things. Yes, exactly. <laughs> if you have questions for Sarah Maslin Near, please do type them into the Q&A feature on the chat and I would love to put them to her. Um, well, if we're thinking of briar horses, I think maybe Misty of Shin Katigue is the gateway drug into yeah. the briar horse set probably. This is the, as you point out in the book, not so factual account of wild ponies living on Assateague Island. This is off the Maryland and Virginia coast. Now you went there to watch the annual Haas Penning. First of all, what is that? Well, Misty of Shingatig is a book that was a phenomenal runaway breakaway hit in 1942. 
um, and it chronicled this yearly uh, culling um, by uh, rounding up and auctioning off the baby horses of a wild horse herd. And uh, Marguerite Henry, uh, an author, wrote about it and made it explode in popularity. And one of the reasons why it's so special, because there are many roundups, is that the horses live on an island and for the auction, uh, they swim them across the, the canal. And it is just, I write in the book, you know, it, they, they thunder into a dream. I mean, seeing 150 horses swirl the water uh, with their four legs, kick it up like, uh, like a, a hurricane. I mean, it is an unbelievable sight. Um, however, Marguerite's beloved story about this wild pony and the two children who gentled her, I unfortunately found out is mostly false. And the problem with being an investigative reporter is you have to get to the truth. And sometimes the truth is just terrible. Um, Misty of Shingatig wasn't a wild pony at all. She was a backyard pet. Uh, the Beebe family has all since died in a various number of horrible tragedies. Right after I was at the barn that Misty ate her oats from its beautiful vintage pails, it burned down. Oh, uh, I went and saw Misty of Shingatig, who is still in Shingatig stuffed and mounted in the Museum of Shinkatig. <laughs> so I will say one nice thing. There's a little treat for readers. Um, I don't think you know this, Virginia. Under the cover of Horse Crazy, um, Misty of Shinkatig and Marguerite Henry collaborated with a gentleman called Wesley Dennis for all the beautiful illustrations. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually purchased, can you see it? One little illustration. Uh, from from there yeah from the Dennis estate and I just I did out of pocket I just wanted it to be a little gift to my readers um, and if you buy your autographed copy from Acapella Books uh, <laughs> local bookstore shop local you can see that so that's my little treat for the reader well so the 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 spectacle that you described from a kayak yeah. of the horses swimming across the bay is so spectacular, but this is PETA is anti -hoss, hoss penning and and other animal rights activists want to shut down the horse racing industry. Mm -hmm. We have a question here from Liz about cruelty towards animals. You tell the story about a trainer beating your horse while you watched wordless. It broke mm -hmm. my heart and I will add mine too. Were you driven to later use your voice as a writer? I, I'd love to think something good came out of it. Yes, and I, I thank you for that question. And I write about that, that I was a party to um, a, a horse abuse uh, when I was a teenager. And I think I didn't speak up because, uh, and I write this in the book, I didn't feel it was my place. Who was I? That's a, a, another thing about that passing and identity. Here I am, this you know nobody uh, of no stature in this world. And the gentleman, uh, I can't even call him a gentleman, the, asshole who abused these horses um, was the illustrious son from a, one of the most famous uh, equestrian pedigrees. And it felt wrong, but I thought this must be how it's done and who am I to say otherwise? One of the things he instructed us to do as children was to remove the water from our horses' stalls uh, the night before a competition. And they wouldn't drink for 30 hours um, and perform their hearts out for us to keep them quiet. I mean, that's evil. Um, and I didn't feel it was my place to speak up. I have subsequently um, used essentially my reporting to learn better uh, ways of being in the horse world. And I have used my voice uh, to uh, really rectify wrongs in the horse world that I I'm quite proud of, even though they came at personal cost. Um, I wrote two exposés recently about uh, two luminaries in the sport. Uh, actually, after my coming out as a horsewoman, mm -hmm. I, I applied it to my journalism. Um, one of the most prominent trainers in the world uh, is George Morris. He was the Olympic chef to keep. Uh, he's a, a multi uh, medal winner for the Olympics. Um, he's essentially the Babe Ruth plus Michael Jordan of the riding world. Um, and uh, it, as a result of an 18 month investigation by mine, he was by me, he was banned from the sport for life for uh, sexually molesting uh, minors throughout mm -hmm. his career. Um, and so I have felt, and people ask me when I say there's a personal cost, um, some people won't deal with me in the industry because he's such a uh, icon. You know, how it happened a long time ago. How could you tell this story? Um, and I tell them I expose the sport's flaws because I love the sport, um, because it can be better and do better. Um, and so, yes, I have absolutely um, 
maybe not made it up to that horse that I watched be abused and said nothing when I was 14, um, but I have made it up to future horses and I will continue to do so. That's interesting because in the book we also meet, if people don't know of him already, Monty Roberts, the trainer known as the man who listens to horses. And then this man that you say had a lot to do with the shift away from the idea of breaking, and I'm using air quotes, a horse, or, or breaking a horse's spirit, as we've seen in so many Westerns. Uh, he helped change the thinking, and he got a lot of enemies. He had a, received a death threats for that, according to him. Um, so tell us exactly what he did. How did he change the thinking about how to, how to gentle horses? Well, in Monty's book, he talks about doing it the wrong way as a young boy. And he says this beautiful sentence. Um, he was watching a, a video of him riding as a a little boy, someone found like a VHS tape of him. He was a child star. Uh, he actually played Elizabeth Taylor in National Velvet. He's the one who's riding with a wig on. I didn't realize no that. No kidding. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, and he says, uh, I can't look at those videos of me riding. I wish I could apologize to Brownie. Uh, and, and, you know, he learned unfortunately, at, at some horse's expense, how to be better. Um, Monty Roberts himself was abused by his father. He says he had 72 broken bones before he was 13. Um, and uh, he felt a fealty and commonality with the horses he watched his father abuse as well. And uh, he writes in his book that he realized quite early on that he was on a different side in that equation, that he was on the horse's side. Um, and he has spent his eight decades on this planet reframing the way that we break horses. We don't even use that word anymore. We call it starting or, or gentling or backing. Um, and he really, by understanding the way horses communicate with each other, applied that language, he calls it equus, to the human horse interaction, which makes a horse not capitulate, but um, perform as an accomplice rather than uh, as a victim. Mm -hmm. So changing the idea of you're the master and that is the, I guess, the instrument of service. Yes, you're the herd member. A horse is, uh, has a predisposition to engage with a herd and respond with it. So he capitalizes on that genetic inclination um, to be its herd member and, and, and uh, be a, part, a partner to it. Susan asks, have you ever considered as a journalist researching the widespread drug use in the horse world and exposing the guilty? You certainly do write about drug use and other cruelties in the, in the book. Yes, I, I, I definitely have. A colleague of mine, Walt Bogdanich, wrote um, a tremendous number of stories on both the racing world and the show jumping world. Um, but I uh, speak out about it in my book, um, really, because Walt cornered the market on that is why I haven't uh, done that yet myself. <laughs> Well, we, we talked a little bit about the challenges to the ways of thinking uh, in the horsey world. And there's also a challenge to the image of horse people that by digging into the history of black cowboys. Now, this is a thriving subculture here in Georgia and across the U.S. Maybe uh, people recall seeing the photos during the racial justice protests of black cowboys. Now, it turns out that one in four cowboys in pioneer, pioneer era America, as you report, were black. Mm -hmm. So what did you find out about black cowboys that are pretty much all but erased from history. Absolutely. I, I uh, was just looking at the numbers of the United States Equestrian Federation that has, um, I, might, I might screw this up, someone will have to fact check me on this. Um, I think it's 83,000 members and 1% identify as black. Wow. Um, you know, black people are not 1% of the country that should be representative. Um, and, and so uh, when you look back at the erasure of black people as part of the American equestrian story, and I don't think the American equestrian story is equestrian, it's actually our American origin narrative. Those are the tales we tell ourselves about who we are. Uh, we hearken back to the cowboys. But when you see that they were erased from that story, it makes sense that you still don't see Black people in the equestrian community. Um, I was about 21 and I was uh, bicycling by the Harlem River, uh, taking a little head clearing moment at a rough moment in my life, pretending I was galloping on a horse. And I thought I saw a mirage, uh, which was a little barn on an island in the middle of the Harlem River. And I threw my bike in a bush and ran across the footbridge and found the New York City Riding Academy, uh, which is run by Dr. and Mrs. Blair. You can only call them that, by the way. Do not call them by their first names. They're very proper. Um, they are two uh, African Americans who started the New York City Black Rodeo. And I uh, became their assistant because they were very elderly. And I worked the horses for them. 
but I just thought it was a Rodney Academy owned by two ornery old folks. I didn't realize or even know this erased history or even presence of black cowboys in the American story. Um, and one day I asked Dr. Blair, um, you know, we have all these inner city children come and we only have three horses and how come we don't teach riding? Because there was no way to teach riding to all these children. We really taught them uh, about horses and horsemanship and but nobody really ever rode. And Dr. Blair said, Sarah, do you know what a cowboy is? And I thought it was a rhetorical question. And he said to me, Sarah, a cowboy is a black man. Hmm. And Dr. Blair is of a school of thought that believes even the word cowboy indicates the blackness of the people who had that profession. Because in the era of its coinage in the late 1700s, you wouldn't call a white man a boy. It was an insult. You had a house boy, you had a yard boy. Um, and so cowboy speaks to that this profession was a black profession. And he said, Sarah, we're not teaching these children horseback riding. We're teaching them that they're part of the American story, that there are other paths out there for them because these were inner city children from the poorest tracts of New York City. And he said, Sarah, we're teaching them to dream. Yeah. And that really stuck with me that moment. And so when I reported the book, I went to find the black cowboys across the country. I found a postman named Larry Callis, uh, who is also teaching people to dream by spending his life savings to create the Museum of the Black Cowboy. Uh, to enshrine cowboys, enshrine nowhere else. Um, and we're having these discussions in the rioting world about inclusion. Uh, now, there's an article in Elle magazine about black equestrians this week, which blew my mind. Mm. Um, uh, but they've always been part of the story. And I spoke to a great historian who said to me, um, uh, he's actually a Jew from New York like me, because in my own people's almost literal erasure from this world, I saw a parallel to the figurative erasure of the black cowboy from the American story. Mm -hmm. And this uh, historian also felt that way, William Lauren Katz, he just passed away. And he said to me, Sarah, black people were erased from the American origin narrative because if they came, uh, cowboy origin narrative, because if they came, they came at the end of a whip and in chains. And that's not the narrative we wanted to remember about ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, reinserting them and realizing they've always been there is really essential uh, to achieving a level of justice. That's so interesting. Uh, you know, the thought that your father was so defiant, carrying this idea that success could be an armor against atrocities, that he could make his mark he, against uh, the, war, the Aryan world that he was trying to you were trying to shoehorn into in some kind of way. But even when you're there winning prizes on the uber waspy Long Island and dragging around this invisible weight that you had of not measuring up, you had some access. But how did, how did that play out in your emotional life outside of horses, like with men, with your fellow interactions, with, with humans, with colleagues? Hmm. It's super interesting. Um, I replicated the relationships with my family in the horse world. Uh, I stuck with this abusive trainer who would never, uh, uh, never uh, praise me, never admire me, um, and no matter how many rosettes I won, because it was this objective correlative for these brothers uh, who, who, would, who I, I write in the book, who declined to love me. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I realized I was endlessly replicating these relationships in numerous different fields. Um, but one way I'll say that horses came into my, my waking, my waking life, my real life, I, I don't know, they feel like two different, right? And my horse world is a dream world, um, was I was the victim of a home invasion in 2010. A man climbed through my window uh, in the West Village uh, when I was sleeping and stabbed me. Um, and it, it was a robbery. Uh, that's all that happened to me. Apparently the police told me, usually in those situations you die, mm -hmm. uh, but I survived. Um, and I developed afterward a post-traumatic stress disorder called hypervigilance, where I heard every noise. Uh, the world, you know, New York City is my baseline. It's my childhood lullaby, but suddenly I heard it all and it became so loud. And what I realized through horses was that's how they live in this world. They're prey creatures, uh, hyper attuned to their environment. Um, hearing all that is how they survive. And I was hearing everything because I was constantly listening for danger um, in a cellular, on a cellular level. Uh, but horses communicate silently with one another. And in talking to Monty Roberts, I, I realized that they are able to get through this too loud world 
with silence and they survive. And the step that I took back from this situation, which helped me heal, was to realize that well, yes, I could learn from them and I could be a part of them and they gave me great fortitude and solace when the world was too loud in their silence. Uh, they didn't have a choice about being a prey creature and I did. Um, and that choice was made for me by a man in the dark, um, but I also had a choice in it, unlike a horse. Um, and, and so um, horses have guided me and propped me up through really every moment of my life. There isn't, I, I say it's two worlds. It, it, for me, it's just one. Hmm. Uh, Charlotte asks, and maybe appropriate to that last answer, for what age of young reader is the book appropriate? So, Charlotte, uh, top secret, I'm working potentially on a young reader's edition uh -huh. of the book, uh, which You will, won't tell a soul. Yeah, tell everyone. <laughs> Um, and uh, I would say the book is appropriate probably for 12 and up. Um, and then the one chapter about being attacked uh, is called Benediction. And what I've been telling pe uh, parents is, uh, you know, they can read the whole book, just skip Benediction. Um, but yeah, I'd say 13 and up. So uh, let's go back to that bit about magic, you know, the, the, the part of your life that is not necessarily the rational uh, reporter type. But while working as a journalist, you found horses all over the five boroughs in that noisy New York City, including yeah. in a brownstone on the Upper West Side. You sought them out all over the world. And besides having a pretty plum job, I think at times, this, there's a thrilling chapter there about the spectacular Marwari horses. These are an endangered breed from India that you think are magic. So how, how did you, first of all, as a Western woman, get to ride one? So first of all, I don't think they're magic. I know they're magic. <laughs> okay, oh. forgive me. Um, a Marwari horse, actually it's the horse on the cover. Um, if you look closely, it's a little hard to see because from behind, uh, they have curlicue ears on the top of their head. Um, they, they meet in a heart at the top of their head. And everything curled is better. I mean, uh, French fries, curly fries, obviously way better. You know, a ponytail, pigtail curled, obviously. So a horse with curlicue ears takes the magic of a horse and just tops it with whipped cream. Um, and uh, I was a spa reporter, believe it or not. I had this cushy period of my life where I ran out, went around the world getting scrubbed uh, by people. And I could only do that briefly because I realized that as I write in the book, um, my parents were psychiatrists who helped heal trauma. And uh, here I was getting lubed up with loads <laughs> for a living. And I, I thought to myself, all this ever healed in the world was uh, sun damage. And I, I, it wasn't how I was built. So it was a very brief period of my life. Um, and uh, during that time, I went to review a spa in Rajasthan and I met a Marwari horse. Uh, and should I read a little? Yeah, could it? you please, I'd love you to set up the, the, the how you, this con, the conversation and how you got on this horse and yeah. with another, with a cavalry officer, I think he was from India. Yeah, so um, when you're on these press junkets where people, uh, the, they basically pay for everything when you're a reporter so that you have an amazing time and then you write, this place was amazing, this hotel was amazing. And you're very, very carefully watched. You can't do anything. They don't want you to stub a toe because they want a, a wonderful report. And by the way, the New York Times doesn't allow press junkets because it's essentially pay for play and I haven't done it ever since. Um, but it was awesome while I did it. And um, my driver, because of course you're being chauffeured around like an insane uh, limousine, heard me constantly asking to ride horses. And he said, you know, they're never gonna let you ride horses because uh, they just don't want you to get bucked off and die and then never write this story they spent so much money on. Uh, so I was like, but I know a guy. And so we zipped away and avoided the minders and I encountered a cavalry officer in the full regalia of the Indian cavalry atop this horse with these insane ears. Uh, as we went out into this marble quarry in Rajasthan. Uh, the last word I heard from the man who owned the horses, he said something in Hindi, and then he said, no gallop in English. <laughs> All right, take corner. <laughs> and we turned the corner, and I said to the cavalry officer, yes, gallop. <laughs> and uh, that's where we go from there. Okay, let's hear it. The Marwari galloped at an impossible speed. Bunching and coiling beneath me, the brown and white stallion was a blur. I thought, I'll skip it. 
Every few seconds, the earth dropped beneath us and the undulating trail through the pulverized rock of the quarry dipped and rose and rippled. My horse's body billowed and constricted with every oscillation of the terrain. In front of us, the black horse's hooves flicked in and out of the dust flaring up behind the stallion and the cavalry officer before us. The air was loud with the rat-a-tat clatter of hooves on unmined marble, then a rumbling of distant thunder when they hit soft packed dirt. The officer darted back a glance over his shoulder as we careened down a slope, and I realized he was checking to see if I was still on. By divine grace, somehow I was. Then he went faster. The breath knocked out of me as my stallion whipped through the hot air. He was going too fast for me to inhale, blasting into the air so that it compressed and felt almost solid, too thick to gasp. Tears from the wind of our flight streamed from my eyes. The flesh of my cheeks flattened against the pressure as the stallion tore into the atmosphere. Then he went faster. At the edge of a green marble ravine, the officer pulled up and my horse dropped from flight to an easy walk without the hint of a jolt. The man pulled a beat up flask of water from a saddlebag and reached across the space between his perspiring black horse and my sweating painted one to pass it to me. I spilled out some on the fur to cool my horse's shoulders before taking a deep glug. The officer grinned at me then, and I saw in his face the democratizing effect of a shared passion. Worlds apart, in the saddles, we were peers. Gallop, he said, <laughs> through a robust guffaw, mimicking me, and the word echoed across the green marble mine as we laughed together. I peered through that heart-shaped gap in the world above my stallion's mane as we stood on the edge of the marble crater. We four were silent then, the officer and me full of the ecstasy of a horse's pure power, loaned to us mere mortals for a moment we hope will never end. Holding his red beret to his he head with one hand, the officer tipped back the canteen to his lips. The water ran from both ends of his white mustache to rain on the exquisite horse beneath him, neither minded at all. Oh, that is just one of many breathtaking rides in thank this you. book of course crazy thank you so much sarah for reading that but that is the thing you know you tell uh the woman francesca who actually ends up not entirely legally uh importing these horses marwari horses to chappaquiddick of all places on martha's vineyard i can ride anything mm -hmm. and there is such confidence in that statement that after struggling so deeply with these internalized distortions i think we can call them about your belonging and your self-worth whether you were in this club what, what do you think that swagger has meant for you for other parts of your life you know, i've never been asked that question and no one's ever pulled that out and i i it's really meaningful to me that you did um it's it's very powerful to me because i've actually been having a lot of issues with confidence in my writing right now um, and i realized i thought that writing this book would be putting a pin in these subjects that have roiled my soul for my whole life and, and you know outing these things uh, it, it's pretty challenging to write um condemning words about your own family um i also uh was in a people magazine a a, a a chapter i don't include in the book um about how i've been uh prosecuting a man who raped me when I was 17 years old. And uh, this all coincided with, with getting strength from horses to, to do these things. Um, and I thought I was putting a pin in it. And then I realized that I was opening a Pandora's box. And it's tremendously affected my ability to ride uh, because riding was my escape from all these things. And now uh, it's become incredibly present. It's all sitting right there on the saddle with me. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't get away from it. And actually this weekend, I went uh, just to jump a big ass jump in a field. I asked a, a friend, I said, I just wanna jump something huge that I don't think I can do. Uh, and I did. And on the landing side of that jump, I thought to myself, that, that's the, the woman I am, that, that's who I am. Um, and I wish I could have that feeling on the takeoff side of the jump, uh, both metaphorically and literally more often, um, but sometimes it takes uh, getting past something to, to find your sense of self again. Um, so that swagger ebbs and flows. Um, and I think you have to constantly uh, reinforce it if you're built the way I am. Yeah. You know, you also find out when you're in India, or maybe you knew this before, I'm not sure, but you point out that in India, the Dalits, who used to be known as the untouchables, mm -hmm. um, were forbidden from riding horses, even in the even in that marriage rite that we've maybe all seen images of the man, the groom coming in on the horse. Um, 
they were some were even murdered for owning a horse. Yep. So this is a class of people that have been persecuted and kept away from riding horses. And I just couldn't help but imagine what would have your life have been? You know, if you were still living in the 1930s and Deep Hollow Ranch and on Montauk said, yep. you know, sorry, Gentiles only. How, what would your life have been without horses? Well, you know, that's what I include that uh, uh, you just cited, um, the ranch I worked at for many years when I was researching this book. Um, I, it, the, from the 1930s, I found a flyer and it stamped on it. It says the clientele is limited to Gentiles only. Um, and so those messages that I absorbed from this community um, are there. They're still the ghost in the machine. You know, that wasn't that long ago. Um, and uh, I, I parallel that, you know, what if to have these creatures that have been such a, uh, a lodestar for me was forbidden in the way that they are for the Dalits uh, in India. Um, but I will tell you that the Dalits uh, who get stoned to this day, even though the caste system has been abolished when they ride to their own weddings, um, they still ride to their own weddings and they wear football uh, padding to do so and football helmets um, and they fought in the high court for protection um, and the image I have of this one gentleman uh, who uh, went to court and, and uh, fought for that right um, the last image is of him riding to his bride uh, surrounded by police protection protecting his right and smiling through the curlicue ears of a Marwari horse mm. uh, so when you have a passion and I don't think this is a uh, just exclusive to horses, uh, you will find a way to access it um, because it's that important. I, I've broken many bones riding. I've had near mortal trauma. And sometimes I think uh, I would die for this, um, but uh, I don't think I would die for a horse. I don't think I would die to ride a horse. I think I would die to have this passion in my life. I think there may be some people out there tonight who can appreciate that. We're so glad you came out, Sarah Maslinier, as a horse person. <laughs> thank you so much for speaking with us tonight. Oh, thank you for this wonderful talk and excellent questions. I really appreciate it. Sarah Maslinier is a New York Times reporter and author of Horse Crazy, the story of a woman and a world in love with an animal. You can get a signed copy and support your local independent bookseller by purchasing a book at Acapella Books. There is a link in your chat. There's also a link on the Atlanta History Center website. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Tomorrow, former CIA director John Brennan will be in conversation with Andrea Mitchell. He's going to be talking about his new book, Undaunted. And next Tuesday, October 13th, Raven Leilani talks with Arts ATL's Gail O'Neill about her debut novel, Luster. You can find a full schedule and Zoom links at atlantahistorycenter.com. Sarah Maslinier, again, thank you so much for speaking with us tonight. Thank you. A total pleasure. <laughs>